just a few observations on Chapter 4 of The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn. Most of normal science involves solving puzzles within a particular paradigm, Kuhn tells us. These puzzles play by the rules of the paradigm, and they tend to be inherently solvable within the paradigm. Kuhn opens the chapter saying, Perhaps the most striking feature of the normal research problems we've just encountered is how little they aim to produce major novelties, conceptual or phenomenal. Well, in ordinary science, we are assuming that we have a pretty good idea of how the world works within a particular field of science, and that idea is the paradigm that guides that particular, um, that particular field of science. And we're not, if we're doing normal science, we're not looking for major novelties, whether conceptual or phenomenal. No, why would we? We're assuming we already do have a fairly good idea of how the world works. That idea is the paradigm. We are not looking to replace the paradigm, no. We're assuming we have a pretty good idea of how the world works, and what's there left to do except fill in the gaps in our knowledge and build on that idea, that pretty good idea of how the world works. And uh, Kuhn notes that when um, we don't get to the results we expect, when uh, experiments don't turn out quite the way we expect, it's usually assumed in normal scientific times that the reason this happens is not that there's any problem with the world and whether the world fits our, our paradigm. No, the, the working theory is that the scientist just wasn't smart enough to find a conclusion, uh, to find an acceptable solution. So uh, in normal science, we assume the paradigm is correct. We assume we have a fairly good idea of how the world works, and we're just trying to fill in the remaining gaps in our knowledge. And if there's a particular gap we can't fill in, well, we don't assume that this means that, um, well, when, when Newtonian physics is dominant, we don't assume this means that Newton's laws of motions are, uh, are wrong. And uh, when, when Einsteinian physics is dominant, that doesn't mean we assume that general relativity is just completely wrong. We assume, rather, that there's probably something wrong with um, the particular scientist who couldn't get the right results. Uh, there's something, something imperfect in that particular scientist's uh, mental capacities, or perhaps his equipment. We don't assume, why would we assume, that our fundamental way of thinking about reality is not consistent with reality, or is not quite right uh, for, for some other significant dramatic reason. We're not looking for major novelties. But if the aim of normal science is not major substantive novelties, Kuhn asks, third paragraph. If failure to come near the anticipated result is usually failure as a scientist, not failure of the paradigm to, to fit reality, then why are these problems undertaken at all? Part of the answer has already been developed. To scientists, at least, the results gained in normal research are significant because they add to the scope and precision with which the paradigm can be applied. We have a working assumption that we have a pretty good idea of how the world works. That idea is the paradigm that guides a particular field of science during times of normal science, and... Why try to fix it? We already have a pretty good idea how the world works. We already know that the paradigm is true. We already know that uh, the laws of motion are correct, uh, as articulated by Newton, maybe with some refinements later on. Or we already know that general relativity is correct. Or we already know um, that Darwinian evolution is correct. Or we already know that um, uh, neo-Darwinian evolution is correct. Or we already know that... Um, uh, Heliocentrism is correct, or at any rate, that the Earth revolves around the Sun, not vice versa. And in a different era, it would be something else. Um, we already know these things, so uh, why try to fix what's not broken? Why, why, in times of normal science, would we bother to look for conceptual novelty? What we should be doing is merely adding to the scope and precision with which the paradigm can be applied. If, um, uh, if the idea that the Earth revolves around the Sun, not vice versa, or the idea of classical Darwinian evolution, or the neo-Darwinian synthesis, or uh, Einsteinian relativity, or Newtonian physics. If this is the correct idea, any one of these, then what else is there to do except add to the scope and precision with which this idea can be applied to explain the world? The terms puzzle and puzzle solver highlight several of the themes that have become increasingly prominent in the preceding pages. Puzzles are, in the entirely standard meaning here employed, that special category of problems that can serve to test ingenuity or skill in solution. Dictionary illustrations are jigsaw puzzle and crossword puzzle. And it's the characteristics that these share with the problems of normal science that we now need to isolate. One of them has just been mentioned. It is no criterion of goodness in a puzzle that its outcome be intrinsically interesting or important. 
Uh, though intrinsic value is no criterion for puzzle, the assured existence of a solution is. What matters is not whether there's an especially interesting or important or exciting solution to a puzzle. Um, uh, say, you assume um, um, uh, classical classical Darwinian evolution is correct, and you find some some puzzle in the fossil record. Um, it's not necessary that you find a particularly um, interesting or important solution. If uh, if the solution is um, that there was some missing link between this thoroughly uninteresting um, species of, of plant life and this thoroughly uninteresting other species of plant life uh, a certain number of millions of years ago, um, who cares? <laughs> it may not be important. What is important is the assured existence of a solution. Though intrinsic value is no criterion for a puzzle, the assured existence of a solution is. We've already seen, however, that one of the things the scientific community acquires with the paradigm is a criterion for choosing problems that, while the paradigm is taken for granted, can be assumed to have solutions. In times of normal science, when we assume that our paradigm for thinking about the world is correct, we only look for puzzles to solve that we assume have a solution within that paradigm. What else would you do in normal science when you're assuming that your uh, basic way of thinking about these things is correct? One of the reasons why normal science seems to progress so rapidly is that its practitioners concentrate on problems that only their own lack of ingenuity should keep them from solving. If, uh, if you're assuming that you have a pretty good idea how the world works, name the scientific paradigm uh, among the examples I just gave or, or any others, you know, read this book. By all means, uh, read this book and, and you'll have a better idea of what sort of uh, illustrations of paradigms um, uh, Kuhn will give you uh, than, than I can give you just, just flipping through the book. This is too brief, you know, this is far too brief. If you want to understand Kuhn, read the book. Take, take these videos as merely a brief introduction. Um, unless you just don't have time. What was that thing I said in that other series? I think it was on John Dewey. I said, um, don't let me do all of your reading for you. Maybe some of it, though. Uh, if I have more time to read philosophy than you, maybe let me do some of your reading for you. But don't do all of it. Uh, don't, don't let me do all of your reading for you. You've got to read some of these books if you want to understand these things properly uh, for yourself. Take me as merely an introduction, uh, unless you don't have time to do any more. But then keep in mind, I'm still just an introduction. Anyway, to get back to the point. Um, during times of normal science, we are assuming that... Our basic way of thinking about things is correct. We're assuming that paradigm is correct. That paradigm is guiding our research then. And we're choosing puzzles that we assume can be solved within that paradigm. And we're naturally gravitating towards the sort of puzzles that can easily be solved in that paradigm. We're going to probably not even notice any puzzles, if there should be any, that cannot be easily solved within the paradigm. And so it looks like science produces pretty rapidly during these times of normal science, because all the time scientists are coming up with cool solutions to all the little puzzles they found on the assumption that, that paradigm was correct. But uh, it's not necessarily that um, they're having any significant increase in knowledge. Uh, it's maybe more a fact that we're choosing puzzles that could be easily solved within that paradigm. It's the selection of the puzzles that uh, uh, is at play here in making things seem like science is progressing especially quickly. If it is to classify as a puzzle, the problem must be characterized by more than an assured solution. There must also be rules that limit both the nature of acceptable solutions and the steps by which they are to be obtained. For a puzzle to be solved in ordinary science, to be a proper puzzle of the sort that needs to be solved in ordinary science, it needs to be the sort that can be solved in ordinary science. It needs to be assured some solution within the reigning paradigm. And there has to be rules. There have to be, there have to be rules that limit the nature of acceptable solutions and the steps by which they are to be obtained. A uh, certain kind of solution, kinds of solutions are not acceptable under a particular paradigm. And certain ways of obtaining solutions are not acceptable. Let's, uh, let's close this video and be done with this chapter with one quick uh, reading from, well, in this edition by University of Chicago, we're on page 39. It's just a terrific example of, um, of how data is interpreted, data are interpreted according to a paradigm. For example, the electron scattering maxima that were later diagnosed 
as indices of electronic wavelength. You know what? Uh, we don't have to stick with English modeling old Latin. For example, the electron scattering maxima that were later diagnosed as indications of electron wavelength had no apparent significance when first observed and recorded. Before they became measures of anything, they had to be related to a theory that predicted the wave-like behavior of matter in motion. And even after that relation was pointed out, the apparatus had to be redesigned so that the experimental results could be correlated unequivocally with theory. Until these conditions had been satisfied, no problem had been solved. Okay, so um, a particular set of data was not even noticed as mattering until it could be reconsidered from the perspective of a different scientific paradigm. Then it could be a measure of something. Until it could be considered under a new paradigm, the data couldn't even be measuring anything. It was just, I suppose a good term is noise. It was just background noise. It was just um, miscellaneous, apparently random, certainly unimportant data uh, that we just, you know, happen to have in the background. Like, uh, you know, if you found a... Um, if you found in the background of this video some some random piece of clutter on a shelf, um, doesn't mean anything. It's not part of the the philosophy nerd trying to explain Thomas Kuhn. Well, if you look at this video with a different paradigm, you, you might find some huge significance in the piece of clutter. Um, well, there's significance in a lot of this clutter. Maybe not all of it. I don't know if those headphones are particularly significant. But uh, a lot of these things do have significance. Uh, anyway, um, you would know the significance unless you're watching this video with the right paradigm. Okay, so um, the data. The data didn't have any significance until they were interpreted according to a new paradigm where they could actually be understood as data measuring some, some actual thing in the world. They had to be related to a theory that predicted the wave-like behavior of matter in motion before they could be interpreted as meaningful data. Till so that, they were useless. After that, they were useful, but not immediately after, because you still had to redesign uh, the laboratory equipment in order to even uh, figure out how to, how to track this stuff. Okay, um, this is a good illustration of the idea that paradigms uh, affect how we interpret data, and affect which data we interpret. Uh, I, I, I want to emphasize one more time, I don't think Kuhn is telling us science is entirely subjective or anything like that. He is telling us that there is uh, not a purely objectivity, there's not a pure objectivity in science. The, the operation of normal science according to a paradigm does involve selecting questions according to the assumption that that paradigm is correct. It involves certain uh, limitations on what sort of solutions can be acceptable and how we find solutions, and it does affect which data we interpret as well as how we interpret the data. And um, I don't think any of that means science is subjective or anything simplified like that. But it does mean it's not purely objective. That's uh, that's the Kuhnian theory. Okay, uh, more I trust in future videos. Perhaps I'll see you then.